Oh yeah, episode 70 of Hell of Black, you feel me? Seven decades of content, you know what I'm saying? On this episode, we have our nigga Q on this motherfucker. We talk about Pan-Africanism and the need for revolutionary violence. Tap in right now. Make sure you fuck with us on Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. We have exclusive, extended content, and many more things for y'all to fuck with. Tap in with us right now. Let's get it. fuck with you. Q. Q remind me of you in the sense of like niggas who be hella up on their history type shit. Like, yeah. Niggas just know hella shit <laughs> and, can, and can refer to hella motherfuckers. Niggas be in the books. That's something I that's something I like. I wasted my college education. I mean I, I majored in, in journalism and I do that. I mean that shit it you gave know. you a good foundation from like I did yeah. A standard lens of journalism and then you was allowed to you use that to apply your I, I use my I use my major yeah. in all of its facets. I just wish maybe I'd I just wish I'd have I had the politicization with it, yeah, or took more history shit because I just felt like I didn't, I didn't create the habit of like, I, I have the habit of research and whatnot, but I'm just hella bad at remembering dates and people. Like I'm not that good at that. Yeah, mind you, history's always been my favorite subject. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not that always good at been. That. And nigga, I went to a Baptist. It's school. also a skill though. Yeah. I, like I think it's something I could have developed if I would if I would have. Nigga, they had us memorizing Bible verses at Baptist school, saying. so like I just used that and applied that shit to history. I was never good at things you had to memorize, math and history. I was terrible at math. But math is like after at a certain point, it's just nigga. But I also see things. numbers backwards sometimes. I don't know yeah. what that shit is called. Dyslexia, nigga. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. See how this nigga just be laughing at me when I keep telling him. You don't know what it's called when you see things backwards. I'm not because I'm not funny. That's not funny. It's not funny. I'm not laughing at dyslexia. I'm laughing at you. Like, yeah, sometimes I see things backwards. I don't know what that is. I'm like, no way, nigga. Hey, yo, yo, yo. Oh, shit. It's what's going on, my nigga? building, man. Yo, yo, what's good? What's good? How you living, bro? Uh, maintaining, staying inside, any shit. <laughs> Shit, I feel you. You got that East Coast accent, huh? <laughs> I mean, a little bit, I guess so. What what it's like where you at right now? You in um, Virginia? Yeah, I'm in Richmond right now. It's, it's cold, really quiet. Um, not as warm as warming up. It's like seventy four right here. I think it's doing well. Yeah. It's freezing. Well, I don't know. People like to say that it's not freezing in the Bay. Whenever we talk to folks that aren't, yeah, yeah. Right, y'all Cali niggas always want to talk about it's cold and shit. Be like, but it is like fifty right, right now. But fifty it degrees is, 50 is cold. Nobody can hear that, bro. That's a good day. Ain't cold. Me. Bro, that's a good day for me. Uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing. I'm wearing. I'm wearing long johns when it's fifty degrees. <laughs> <laughs> No, you right. <laughs> yeah, my nigga, we was just just saying that it's been a long time coming. I'm glad we we finally got you on. I feel like niggas been talking about this for like a year. No bullshit. It's been like probably about a couple of years. Almost been. I, I say for it's been a couple months. I feel like it's almost been about a year and a half for real. Damn that's what I'm saying. Probably. <laughs> like when we initially, that's what I was telling him. Like we initially wanted to have you and Kings on for an episode, um, and I felt like niggas like threw that out there. Like a year ago, and we we wasn't able to to put it together. And then, excuse me, reached out to you separately, like six months ago, because we gonna have him on to talk about the um, Soleimani shit. And then, right. I think we're gonna have you on again, like a month ago, and we couldn't make it shake. Regardless, I'm happy we finally got you on, bro. It's it's been a long time coming. Yeah, it's all love for sure. For those that aren't familiar with Q, um, probably most known by his at at Q Got No Rings on Twitter. Um, writer, podcaster, educator. As you heard him earlier saying, he's hailing from Richmond, Virginia. I know some of our listeners are going to be like, you know, we from real Richmond, Richmond, California, but yeah. we got Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I fuck with Richmond, Virginia. Is that where Hampton is? Or no, Hampton is in. Hampton is about, that's about 40 minutes. Yeah. I feel like I, I, yeah. I went on a black college tour. We stopped at, at Hampton. So I remember like driving. Driving was, through Richmond? Yeah, driving through Richmond. 
for sure. Now you a student organizer and activist at VCU too? Man, the way that these words have become so used, bro, I'm just a, a nigga who gives a fuck at this point. <laughs> like, I give it, like, I, I give a damn. Like, you know what I'm saying? When it comes to organizing and activist work, I feel like that comes with such, like, baggage now that has been completely thrust upon to the title because of the aestheticization of Black Lives Matter, and I'm not really... Yeah. I was really into it. I just, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, whenever some people, people say it, it's cool, but it's like, you know. Yeah. I think that's one thing we say, even ourselves, is like, bro, we just niggas who care about our community. You know, but by definition, niggas is organizing and shit like that. You feel me? So, but yeah, now I hear you 100%. I think that's, you know, your response is a response that a lot of niggas who I feel like have really radical pro- politics have been saying, you know, like, damn, niggas, I'm just a nigga who care. <laughs> you know, because a lot of that shit, that's how we start our organizing. To be honest, it's like, bro, it's like we care about our community. You feel me? Like, I didn't even really know, you know, some of the best organizers I know that probably have not ever referred to themselves as an organizer. Yeah, I think about black folks in general, especially poor black folks where, you know, congregating and coming together. Community is just a, a necessity for survival. Niggas wouldn't consider themselves organizers. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I'm thinking about my grandma and shit. Like, she for sure wouldn't call herself an organizer. You know what I'm saying? Even though by, quote unquote, by definition, yeah. that's what a lot of us have done to survive in this nation since niggas yeah. got here. And that's a good follow-up to our last episode around mutual aid. Like, niggas has been doing mutual aid for years, you feel me? For centuries, damn near. But we didn't always have the words to call it mutual aid, you feel me? So a lot of the shit we've been doing as black people, as African people, you feel me, has been rooted in, in care and love for our community. And we haven't you always used these terms that are new. You know, so, who man, I'm just to have you on. It's gonna be, it's gonna be some heat, bro. I think it's a long time coming. I know you got a lot to contribute, so we appreciate you for coming on for sure. For sure, man. It's all love for sure. I'm excited. You know, we, we usually start with, with Black Joy, uh, and uh, uh, I guess considering the times, you know, niggas been stuck in the house. I was having a conversation with B yesterday, and we was talking about how so many of the things that we do for like self care, which I think are rooted in a lot of our like are connected to a lot of our joyous experiences, um, have been kind of taken away with all these shelters in place. Um, but yeah, do you have, what's been your black joy considering the circumstances? Man, um, I'll probably say about like two days ago, me and Miles was probably, yeah, we moved downstairs looking through old scrapbooks of like, you know, old family photos and whatnot, seeing like the lineage and whatnot, seeing like, you know, my great grandfather, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm named after the slave. You know, most people are in this country if you're from America, if you're black. But um just seeing the lineage and like seeing like how little we progressed and how far we pro- progressed and just the different ways in which family has to kind of protect each other, that type of stuff, it makes me happy as it does make me, you know, sad at the same time, but it's a it's a overwhelming amount of joy that comes from it in the end because I know that the people are always going to protect each other. So just seeing like family and seeing people who I've never even met and my mother's stories and whatnot, I think that ancestry and our lineages, man, that type of stuff is hands down the most important because if we're not doing this for the people who we never met and the people who we won't meet, then who are we doing it for? You feel me? So. Yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, man. I, um, I think on a on an earlier on our previous episode, I was talking to I, my Black Joy moment was kicking it with my granny, and we was just sitting on the porch and, and talking about um, you know what life out in Oakland was like in her neighborhood, you know, like forty years ago, and I don't know, just like hearing her again, like hearing her story, hearing about my family's history on the block, it it again made me hella frustrated because we talking about a place that's being severely gentrified, right? But also. At the same time, it did fill me with some joy because it's like, damn, like niggas do got a history. Niggas, I do have a reason to keep to keep fighting, right? Just because shit is not what it once was, you know, that's not an excuse. I got to do it for, you feel me? Again, my great grandfather who put in all this time and work to acquire this land and for, you feel me, my great great niece who I, who I ain't met yet type shit uh, or who I might not ever meet. So, yeah, I could definitely, um, I feel you on that. What about you, B? So, you know, I upgraded my Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's been a joy moment because nigga's been in the house. <laughs> you feel me? So, nigga got better Wi-Fi. Yeah, so, you know, I've been 
than fucking around on GTA without my network dropping. So that's been <laughs> that's been some joy. Just playing, you know, Xbox. That's some shit like I feel like I was doing as a kid more. But you know, as you grow older, like your time kind of just disappears in a lot of ways, especially in college playing sports and shit. Of course, niggas was playing two K, but I probably haven't really played no like video games really until, you know, now somewhere. So I guess that's one one positive shit and some joy that I've, I've gotten is doing some of those shit that gave you joy as a kid, as an adult. So that's, that's been my joy. What about you? I've been dumbass stressed out for the last week. I'm gonna keep it a band. Nigga, I don't know when my Wi Fi is the biggest joy that I've been stressed out. <laughs> like, I've been so stressed out, bro. I'm a. Um, I don't even know, my nigga. Oh, I did like. I think. I think I've seen it as the norm over the last few weeks, but a, a lot of folks have been doing like group FaceTimes. Um, and I, I did one with a bunch of the men in my family last week. So that was cool. Um, you know, just talking to my cousins, and I realized, like, damn, I ain't seen these niggas a hell of long, and I don't know when the next time I'm gonna see these niggas. Uh, so that was dope, bro. Just linking up with with all my cousins, talking shit on Facetime, getting a chance to see these niggas and everybody hairlines and shit. You know, <laughs> hairlines are going crazy by the wayside, the fire, man. <laughs> going by the wayside. Niggas, widow peaks coming out, huh? Yeah. So that was dope, but just 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 chopping game with the fam, bro. I enjoyed that shit. So I think, you know, we kind of set the, we laid the foundation to dive into the conversation with um, Q talking about his black joy and, and spending time with family and, and getting a little bit, know a little bit more about his history. Q, we talk about you being from, from Richmond, Virginia. Um, and I think folks that are familiar with you also know that you have ties t- to Philly. So on, on, the, on the, the topic of like, you know, getting to know the history of these places that you associate with, how has you know, in the deep black history in, in, uh, in Richmond, the deep black history in Philly, like how has starting to, to, to understand that history allowed you to develop a deeper respect for these places? Word, word. I think that it's probably the stark contrast in the similarities in the two that are <laughs> hilarious to me, as well as it is like very sad. But in terms of Richmond, Richmond is, one of those cities where five minutes you'll be in a suburb, the next five minutes you'll be in the hood, the next five minutes you'll be in the city. It's just one of those county, city, suburbs. It's very in- interlocked. So there's going to be a lot of different struggles. And from the time in which I was young, I'd probably say from the time I was probably about five, my mother always had like an imperative to introduce me to black history from not just Richmond, but from Virginia period. Like, Nat Turner, Norfolk, that's like real history that I was always inspired by. Uh, Gabriel Poster's Rebellion in Richmond is one of probably the more well-known uh, forwarded slave, slave rebellions in the South. Um, going from the multiple different historical figures and black liberation figures that have sprung out of Richmond from the times of antebellum slavery to even now, um, it's actually probably one of the more underrated states and just cities, period, in terms of black history. So I got to give respect to my mother and all my elders who put me on to the literature and the gems. Philadelphia is a different story um, because, you know, that's obviously a city. And people like Mumia, Russell Schultz, people like the Move Africa, the Africa Move Africa, uh, sorry, the African Move movement, that is probably three of the most influential events on my entire life. Because Mumia is probably, at this point, he's been in jail for well, over over 26 years now. So before I'm, I'm, I'm even born, I have family who is protesting for Mumia. I have family who was trying to get him released. And these type of things were just kind of passed down to me. And these ideals were just kind of bred into me at this point. And I have to give so much respect to Philadelphia and to just Virginia as a whole, because without them, I'm not this person. Um, I would also want to say that if people want to know anything about liberation work, anything about, you know, uh, freedom, <laughs> le- le- learning anything about freedom, the two most formative is going to be for me, 
Nat Turner's Rebellion, and Mumia, because both have articulated what is necessary. We need the praxis and we need the minds. Because Nat Turner, while this is not Richmond, Virginia, I went to school in Norfolk, so I got the history there too. I moved all around Richmond and moved all around Virginia uh, as a as a child. So I've gotten the game from multiple different elders and multiple different scholars who have basically just been in a place where there's not a lot of emphasis on Virginia being a site of black radicalism. But there's an alternative history here that people don't know, especially the new African independence movement. I could go on for days and days, but, you know, I'm just, you know, in love with both places and both have a special place in my heart, always will. Yeah, I think Philly gets a, gets, um, in terms of recognition as far as like black, black history, black radical history, Philly gonna get a lot more love than Richmond because, you know, the, the, the scope that Philly is under and I think having a, the, 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 the amount of like research and history one has to do to really understand the impact that, that Richmond, Virginia has had um, in liberation work for black folks in America. Yeah. So just following up on that cue, is there a moment that politicized you? And I know you kind of spoke about that, you know, geographically, um, but there was any mm -hmm. moment or event, you know, that you went through in your life that helped shape your politics mm -hmm. and helped radicalize you? Uh, my mother gave me all about career Malcolm X in fifth grade. She a real one for that. <laughs> no, for real. She was, she was like, she was like, if you want to em emulate any black man, this is the black man you need to emulate. And I was like, okay, word. Sat down, <laughs> read the book. Nah, from then on, it was on, man. From then, I had a class project dressed up like Malcolm. I, I made a Malcolm board game, bro. I had, a, bro, I had a, I had a get out of get Elijah out of jail free card. I promise you, it was real. I promise you. Was, you. you was one of the students is, who was. These are the formative right? years. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you was like, you was fucking with your teacher and shit. For sure, for sure, for sure. And they, you know, they definitely had to sit me down and uh, talk to me about how it's, you know, cool to respect all cultures and whatnot. But they always do that when you try to respect your people. You know what I'm saying? I always try to tell be tolerant. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but, you know, it, it is what it is. So, you know, Malcolm definitely is probably the most formative figure for me. That event changed my entire course of my life because I admired Malcolm's strength. I admired his fearlessness. And I think that that's what attracts to set men to Malcolm is the lion heart of it all where it's like, well, oh, I'm not, I'm not folding. I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of anybody. And those type of actions, those type of words and what he was willing to live and die for, it definitely inspired me. I'll also say secondary event will probably be Trayvon Martin. Um, I remember being sunk into the floor when they read that verdict. And the thing is, though, I knew they were going to read it as not guilty, but I think that it's just sometimes, you have to have, like, that slap in the face, like, okay, I forgot where I was at. You know what I mean? Like, at this time, this is a time in my life where I was I was beginning to really realize what the deal was with the American government, with Obama and all these people. I still was trying to hold on to some type of, well, you know, maybe Barack is, no, nah, man. As soon as I understood what this country was and as soon as I saw that, you know, the president, the black president was, wasn't going to stick up for this black kid, nah, man, it was over. You were, how old were you? You like 14 when that happened, maybe? Because you were a little younger than me and Blake, right? Yeah, I'm 23 right now, so yeah. what, when was that, 2013? Yeah, so you was probably in high school then. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was remember. I think I was Richmond like 10th grade. 10th grade? Yeah. 10th grade, yeah. <clears throat> Tim Gray, yeah. That's wild, bro, because like, the work that I've done with high school students, like, them niggas... Be with the shit. <laughs> yeah, bro. You like for you to be able to like, all right, nigga, at fourteen, I started seeing shit for what it was that having yeah. a black president didn't mean shit <laughs> in this country. Uh, I mean, it's because Trayvon was that age. Yeah, I think too. You know what I mean? Like that shit. And this, bro, it's wild. Me and Blake was just having this conversation before you got on that, like, black folks' infatuation with Barack Obama causes them to be delusional. Like I've heard people be like, "Oh, I miss my president." And it's like, my nigga, do you realize under your, this is, under your president, Trayvon Martin happened. George Zimmerman walked, walked off scot-free. Mike Brown happened. The Black Lives <laughs> Matter movement started. And y'all niggas want to go back to an Obama presidency during a pandemic because it was so-called better? When niggas was getting killed under that presidency, too? Brahms was getting dropped? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. That's nah, a whole other nah, tangent. Nah, almost, have, yeah, that's a whole other tangent for me. Don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get more to, you know, the, them, uh, them black cultural people than the than, than nationalists in terms of, oh, yeah, we see a black person as a president. We see it in that so, so-called uh, freedom, some shit like that is the word that's they want to use. I'm going to reword this question since, you know, we spoke about niggas not fucking with titles <laughs> and shit. But we do have a lot of black college students that listen to Hella Black. Um, so what has been a black student at a PWI that's trying to, that's doing black liberation work, black radical work, what has that experience been like for you? Uh, alienating and as lonely as hell. Um, for real, if I'm, I can keep it a stack with you. When it comes to organizing at PWI, so if you're a black student and you're not cooning, then they won't take you seriously. Um, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, when it comes to BSUs and it comes to, you know, or student organizations, that's all controlled opposition. Even the folks that are trying to do great things within those orgs, they're going to handicap you with either funding, they're going to handicap you with noise ordinances, they're going to handicap you by putting pressure on you with the administration. It's a whole bunch of BS, but it's necessary work. I haven't been active on the campus in probably about a year and a half due to financial struggles and just, you know, working and whatnot and trying to complete my degree because the able SS, um, the ableist school that I go to does not believe in my disability as a legitimate concern, but that's fine. That's a whole different tangent. But the whole crux of the issue for black student organizers on PWI campuses is the fact that we will always run into white socialists, we'll always run in to white DSA groups who privilege the class question over the race question. And that's bullshit. And you know what that is? That's just their colonial inheritance. That's yeah. the reason why they don't want to talk about the race question because their colonial inheritance is the very foundation for this planet. Because it's going to require niggas to do more work. work. <laughs> more work. Exactly. The real work. And that, exactly. And also exactly. drop a lot and of their I'll, privilege that they have even though they, you know, are so-called socialists. A lot of them niggas have a lot of fucking class privilege that don't want to be talked about. But they get to a college campus and put a DSA rose on and they're like, oh, socialism. Do people want to put the fatigues on and be like, oh, I'm really in, in the mud. It's like, but I'm fatigued. <laughs> clean as hell. But it's fine. But the thing, like, like this shit that's crazy to me, I'm sorry, this shit that's bad to me. You can curse. Oh, my fault. Yeah, able, yeah, my bad. So, no, yeah. <laughs> but the, like, the, stuff, the, stuff that, the stuff that's bad to me oh, in terms of being able to pinpoint it, it's just got to be the fact that we will never be taken seriously on PWI campuses. But that's a larger question because black people will never be taken seriously within America, period. Thanks. Yeah, and no, I resonate a lot with what you were saying, like especially dealing with other black students who are going to be opposition, you know? So like at Cal, you know, we had 10 demands. We was fighting for a resource center, you know, fighting for scholarship for, you know, students with, you know, 0% estimated family con contribution. So basically students who have the least amount of money, right? And like we literally had, like I had my own student or my own peers as a student. Like, oh, y'all niggas is like terrorists, bro. Y'all is like ISIS, bro. Like niggas was saying the most outlandish shit just because we wanted a resource in it. And I think that's, it kind of speaks, you know, to I think what happens at a lot of these, you know, prestigious universities, colleges is that it's a lot of people who are middle class who are trying to be, continue to be middle class. Or you have niggas like, who want to come become the Jay Z's or become the niggas who was working at Goldman Sachs? So they have that a whole different class attitude that doesn't give a fuck about the masses of black people, you know. And that's one big ass thing I'd be seeing on college campuses amongst black students. So it makes it real hard, you know, because even for us it was like it was a very few amount of us black radicals, you know, and like half the community wasn't fucking with us, even though we was trying to get them they they rights and they resource center. You feel me? Niggas be calling. No, I can tell you. Man, I can tell you it's probably about max. We probably had at max maybe 14 people at a meeting. Like, they, they, through every endeavor, whether it was trying to stop um, commencement from getting canceled because they were trying to uh, gentrify another neighborhood and put costs there, whether it was because of increased police presence. It's just we were never able to garner truly the full attention that these issues deserve because on a lot of cases, the black students and just the students, period, were not receptive to the idea that something is wrong with trying to destroy historically black 
uh, communities like uh, Shaco Bottom in Richmond and uh, Jackson Ward, which, you know, VCU, the, the, the place that I went to, they have been moving further and further inland on encroaching upon these black communities, buying up the properties, buying out grandmother's houses, increasing police presence. And meanwhile, VCU is getting all of this money to spend on nothing that is helping black students in terms of Africana studies. They're not doing anything for humanities. All the money is going to the STEM and tech, which is actually just a big funneling job for a weapons contractor. So, you know, if this is the university system at its core, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, a, it's a colonial instrument. You know what I mean? Like, the, it's just kind of what it is. Facts. Yeah. And we, we were talking about um, how, like, black radicalism does not pay. It's often, like, glorified and amplified as long as it's not actually threatening to the status quo. Like, niggas be on these campuses, the folks that are, the students that are trying to do this real work on campus, you know what I'm saying, not getting the support that they need, but then you get these, these people that go out onto the internet and make all these, and try to align themselves yeah. with the work, try to align themselves <laughs> with the movement. I mean, shit, even at, uh, at Howard, you know, during, during the protests at, you know, HU Resist was having, the university itself made like a black opposition group to Howard of students <laughs> and weaponized them to kind of distract from the protests of HU Resist, you know, so... It's, it's wild what the university will go to, but it just shows you like the way they're, that's almost setting up like a coup, you feel me? And if we understand that these universities are sites of colonization, it's a colonization in, uh, institution, we understand exactly what it's doing too, you feel me? And Q, you brought up a good point too, is like these universities is gentrifying the community, you know, but a lot of people, like you're from that community, Q, right? So it's like, you're going to be tapped in, you're going to know about it, right? But a lot of students, I'm sure, I'm sure aren't from that community, so they don't know the his history behind that community. You feel me? So it hits a lot harder. They don't care to know the as history. A nigga. <laughs> exactly. A lot of niggas don't care. Like, I'm just here to get my college, bro. Black excellence. Four years, I'm out. But on, the, <laughs> but on campus, preaching that, preaching that black power shit, but not understanding how the, the work today at the university is affecting the black people in the surrounding neighborhoods. Oh, man, I, I wish it was that. I wish it was that good for us out here, man. People out here, you know what I'm saying, talking about you know, we just got to elect Joe Biden. We got, you know, black student groups that are dedicated to, you know, making the next CEOs. We got black student groups that are about trying to get Western investments in Africa. It's bad out here, but I'm going to tell you right now, like, like the university is a site of violence for the colonized person, period. Like, it's just, it's just not, no matter where you at, HBCU or PWI, you just, you know what I'm saying, you behind enemy lines both in both places. Yeah, that's just real. So I know one thing we was excited to talk about is just like this concept you know that you talked about i think we've talked about too is like revolutionary violence and why revolutionary violence is important so i remember you tweeting about you know putting down the ballot and picking up a brick can you go into more detail about what that means and just just this idea of revolutionary violence yeah so revolutionary violence is the armed or unarmed direct engagement with the state and all of its agents that's kind of what it is it's, it has to be an organized front and it has to be something that is not necessarily a spontaneous event, but it has to be something that is manufactured through the process in revolution. Because revolutionary violence is not something that is always a first option unless the people are being met with direct fascistic violence. You know, like, unless you're, you know, a Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto, you're probably not going to fight back immediately until, like, you know, the Nazis are really starting to shoot you. There are those who do directly engage with with the state when threatened but to for it to be revolutionary violence that means that a consciousness has had to been fostered within a sizable portion of people who are willing to throw their discussion for their life and the enemy's life away that's what revolutionary violence is but people have to be organized to do that and i also want to be clear that when i say pick up a break i'm talking about right now as it stands that's a theoretical thing because we should be ready to do that. But in terms of the, the present moment, it's not safe to be outside. It's not safe to stage revolutionary violence. It's not, it's not, the conditions are not there yet. Cause it's like, as Thomas Sankara says that, you know, a soldier without any type of training has the potential to be a criminal. And if people don't know why they're being violent, then that has the potential for collateral damage that we did not foresee. Mm -hmm. Facts. 
Yeah, no, that, that's real. I mean, because I think for, for us, you know, it's like we believe in the gun, right? We believe in the gun as a means of self-defense, you know, for our community. But that doesn't mean that every nigga need a gun. <laughs> because without politicization, you, like what you was just saying, right? What good is the gun if you're not politicized about it, right? Because the goal of the gun, right. you know, I think uh, Chairman Mao said the goal of the gun is to eliminate the gun. That's why we pick up the gun. You feel me? Like, we don't like guns, but our enemy is using guns. We don't like, you know, these other, you know, weapons they use, but our enemy is using it. So, shit, we have the right to use it, too, to defend ourselves, to defend our people, and, and for self-determination of all black people. Yeah, exactly. I Another important part of that was like, you talking about the words that you use over and over again was organized. I think that when people talk about, you know, violence or they, they bring up the gun, people and, and, and refer to the past, let's, let's use the Panthers, for example. Motherfuckers don't understand just how strategic they were with their, with their responses to violence Bruh, or violence, right? That nigga Huey was dumb at, or hella smart, you feel me? Like, and then also the exact codes of everything. Okay, nigga, I am eight feet away from you, pig. This is the exact policy that says I can be eight feet away with you armed with a shotgun pig. Like, niggas actually was very in tune with the law, even though it's fucked the law, right? And even when it comes to the tactics, right? Like, niggas have vets in that shit. It's not just sometimes when people think about, like, arming themselves, it's like, I'm going to get my strap and I'm going to bust back. But niggas, you know how to shoot? (laughs) It's going to be effective, dog. It got to be, it has to, there has to be some organization and there has, like, they have to go hand in hand. The organization and the politics got to be behind it. Or what's what happens when the violence is ceased? Yeah. And I think that that brings up another good question. Mm. It's just like, what is the importance of organization, Q, like within these revolutionary movements? You know, because I think it's, we've entered a time where hella shit is just hella individual. You feel me? It's individual this, individual that. It's book deal this, book deal that. You feel me? It's like, it's all about individual. Mm -hmm. You feel me? But if we study Mm -hmm. our history and we know our history, organizations have always been on the front of revolution. So can you talk a little bit more about the importance of, of revolutionary organizations? Yeah. Organization is one of the two imperatives. You have to have study and you have to have organization. And that's all. And I want to make a caveat that this is for people who are able to organize people who have groups around them that they can, or in groups that they can form. This is what I'm talking about. There are people who are in places around the world and in this country where it's, you know, very scarce organizing or there's reactionary organizing. So I want to get that caveat. But for those who are able to do so, and for those who are in the proper conditions, organization is one of the two imperatives. You have to be able to know why you're moving before you move. That literally is like your directions. Your organization is the roadmap to what you're trying to do. This shouldn't. This is kind of basics one on one, but I like to explain everything in basketball terms sometimes. So it's like I can't expect my team to go out there and win if they haven't watched the film and if they haven't practiced, you feel me? So it's like, this is, this is, you know, the number one imperative is we have to have people who are willing and able to engage and manufacture the consciousness that we all need. Because before our feet can move, before our feet can even touch the ground, before people can even leave the house to join up in these cadres and communes or whatever, you know, whatever the hell people want to do before any of that, there has to be, a through line that unites the people consciously. It doesn't have to be 100% alignment on objectives. It just has to be objectives that we can all agree upon. You see what I'm saying? So organization is the number one, in my opinion, goal for the left in the next 10 years. Otherwise, we can kiss this whole thing goodbye. Yeah, because we know the opposition is very, very organized. They got 400 years plus of organization to keep this shit intact. Yeah, it's like we are the masters of people, bro. But it isn't a question of us being like outsmarted, nigga. We is out organized. Yeah. Simply put, we is out organized. You feel me? The police, highly organized. The military. Military, highly organized. You feel me? And these are gonna be the these are gonna be the groups that they're gonna use to keep this shit intact. That they're gonna continue to, to use to keep this shit intact. Exactly. What one thing I want I wanna touch on, um, because I know B and I, when we, when we have these conversations in front of people in reference to like violence being a, a key element, like you can't talk about liberation from a white supremacist state, from an imperialist nation without accepting the reality that violence is going to be a part of that, right? Because violence is what was used to obtain it and violence is what's used to uphold it. 
Um, and we experience violence at the, at the hands of the state every day, right? So it's not always nigga physical violence, but you feel me? This like, pandemic is violence. <laughs> you feel me? Like, so I, one thing, um, yeah, Q, I was hoping that you could just provide some, in, some insight as to why it's important that we accept that reality. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that, could you, could, could you like rephrase the question? I, I, I don't want to take it someplace where I don't think you're going. So I'm saying like, People talk about liberation, people talk about radical, revolutionary, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and they think this can all happen through mm -hmm. nonviolent tactics. And mm -hmm. we know that that's not the case. Right. Yeah, well, they will be fools to believe that. Because if you look at history, history is always going to be our guide. As Africans, as workers, as colonized people, as captive Africans, whatever you want to call yourself, history is our guide. And history has shown that it has been the sword and the bullet that has seized power. And it's always been the organization of the people. Now, I'm not advocating that people take this as the first step. There are steps nice. that need to be taken before violence is even on the table. There's strikes, there's organizing and trying to get your union stronger, there's organizing walkouts, there's all types of different methods and tactics that we can do before we even have to start loading shit up. You know what I'm saying? Nice. But when it comes to, but when it comes to people trying to have this utopian and idealistic socialist revolution. Show me one time in history where there's been no bloodshed and yet the state has fallen. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about this shit is like, if you study your history, right. And a lot of these people, you know, even these, these so-called Bernie Bernard stands, bro. Like then niggas, I know they study. So these people are also like willfully choosing to ignore the history that has led these liberation movements, that has led to revolution, you feel me, that has led to overthrowing these I mean, well, that's states. whiteness in its purest form is the ability to pick and choose what you want your reality to be, so. Shit, I'm talking about some of these black people who support you, <laughs> to be honest, like. <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm if I'm being about. real, if I'm being real, that shit still stands. <laughs> because the way that they got our minds colonized, yeah. bro, Whew. Man, they be identi they be identifying, they identify. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. slaves be identifying with the best interests of Massa because Massa has made them see themselves as an extension of them. That's why people say our country, our, our us. You know what I'm saying? When they talk about the military versus anyone else, it's colonization. We see ourselves as as an extension of the colonizer. Yeah. And a lot of us have that ingrained in us, so we believe that we don't have to hurt Massa because you know Massa was with us a long time ago. And, you know, he's still a human, right? Even though he hasn't seen our humanity in 400 plus years, dude. So what you talking about? You know what I'm saying? So it's all just foolishness. You got to look at history. And we got to stop coddling people who want to hold on to this, you know, well, maybe we can care bear and hug it out. Hell no. Nah. That's, nah. that's where I'm at with it. Like, again, there's so many it's so many steps to be taken before a niggas actually just bare arms type shit, right? But it's like, my nigga, if you think this going to happen without it, and it's even all the Good niggas. Look. It's all the niggas they praise too. So it's like if you study history and you study King, bro, King was praised as an integrationist. King was praised as a nigga who would turn the other cheek. King would be like, "Oh, I love you, even if you was hurting me." You feel me? And how did King die? King was King died a fucking you know an anti capitalist. They even shot to death. They even shot to death. On top of that, King applied. You feel me? To have a strap, bro. King had niggas outside of his house without with straps. You feel me? Like, his, literally his last conversation with Belafonte was like, I believe I have integrated my people into a burning house. You look at Du Bois. Du Bois was one of the most praised integrationists, assimilationists. That nigga died a communist in Africa. You feel me? So even these niggas who was pushing these integrationist mm -hmm. theories at first, if you study the whole life of them, you see how they changed and moved more towards a revolutionary uh, theory and revolutionary action. But it's like, niggas, just forget that. Man, they, they use violence without being provoked. So what what do you think they're gonna do when you get these niggas a reason? Like, come on. Exactly. No, exactly. And that's because, you know, violence is at a constant in America. Because at every turn, the original sin is violence. You can't you can't decouple America from the violent original sin. We can't uncouple fourteen ninety two from the present day. I make the point all the time, the first president is a rapist and so is the forty fifth. So where's the progress at? This is this is the same colonizer. This is the same person. It's just a different method. And progress is often judged by how well the bourgeois class of colonized people are doing. And it's just, I don't, it's just, nah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not really into that. 
And for people to want to be proliferating this idealistic socialist revolution with the Bernie campaign and hoping that we can just talk it out with these people, let me be very clear with you. The Trump administration has somebody in it who we don't even know just how evil that those people are. We have somebody like Mike Pompeo, who is Secretary of State, who says that he's excited that the polar ice caps are melting because it will expose natural resources. So quite literally, the colonizer is telling you, I'm going to kill you all, and you're not going to do anything about it. The gun is already in our faces. It's, us, it's, us, it's on us to bust back at this point. The gun has been in our faces for 400 years. If you can't hear that shit by now, I mean, come on. Man, a bar. A bar. <laughs> That's like, a bar. Like, That's all you can really say after that. Like that. Niggas gotta be, I think once you're able to recognize all the different ways that the state is being violent against, being violent against you, you like, have no the choice. The least I can do is pick up a gun. <laughs> nigga, like, That's the least niggas can do. <laughs> what you talk about, nigga? Environmental violence, nigga? We talking about saving the fucking world at this point, bro. We ain't even talking about, you know, like we was we was talking about saving the world. And that's that's the urgency that I feel like we need to have to organize. And we can't just be organizing on some bullshit over some democratic fucking campaign, nigga. We gotta organize the people to overthrow the shit that is pointing the gun at us, that has been pointing the gun at us, you know, for four hundred years. So, you know, fresh off the press, you feel me, we got Bernard Sanders dropping out of the race, man, you know, and, and all we can think about is like all the time that was being used and all the effort that wasn't supporting him that could have been used to dismantle the system, right? So, you know, what's your thought on, uh, on Bernard's, you know, dropping out of the race and but just even his campaign and how we've seen a lot of, you know, even a lot of quote unquote movement people working for Bernie. Um, let, me, let me be clear that if we're going to be talking in what people like to call practicality, okay, let me just say, Bernie was the quote unquote best choice. Okay, if everyone who's going about to get mad at me, are we cool now? All right, <laughs> Bernie and his campaign. Bernie and his campaign. Dog, they're a bunch of settlers. Like I've been trying to tell people, there is no path to liberation through Washington D.C. There is no path to freedom through the Capitol building. None. There will never. Uh, but how is how is a house that's built by slaves? Don't come on now. Like come on, y'all. Like like what are we talking about? We talking about Washington D.C. Somebody talking Allen Iverson. We talking about D.C. D.C. The D.C. that has neglected, has gentrified, has murdered Jim Crow, turned the left cheek, sabotaged with crack guns, and all the ills of society have been thrust upon black people by this one central location, the most evil location on the place of the planet, Washington D.C. An absolute abomination is a settler hub of violence. You expect that to liberate you. You expect that machination that has been in design for hundreds of years through the systems and institutions that have hardened to make our oppression even worse and more visceral, I mean visceral, you expect that location to be the thing that's going to save you. See, this is why I know people aren't reading. People ain't doing the reading. They ain't doing the reading. <laughs> Everybody, bro, everybody's talking in class, but nobody's doing the readings. And the, niggas, obvious. the niggas reading the George Washington biography, nigga, and they ain't reading Malcolm X. <laughs> it's, it's obvious, man. It's obvious. And I just, I don't, I don't like, I feel like it can't get any simpler than the way you just broke it down. It's like, dog, you're talking about the place that was designed to kill you. You feel me? To, to kill enslave, enslave, enslave dog. To steal the land of indigenous peoples. And you want to be on that table? What does that say about you? That the literal location where with strokes of pins, they have killed millions. In that location, with strokes of pins, they have made sure that black youth never had a chance. With strokes of pins, they've locked up hundreds of thousands in the new slave system with strokes of pins in that location they dropped bombs and have changed the entire geographic layout of the planet because of so much uranium and so much nuclear energy that they put out into the planet this is the location that y'all think somebody like bernie fucking sanders is going to go into and change you are out but 
you out, you have lost, you have lost the plot. If, if you, you think believe anybody, that, if you think anybody, 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 anybody. anybody. H. R. Brown, Jamil Alamine tells us this: if we if we put if we put the ghost of Fred Hampton in, in the Oval Office, we can, we gotta fight against that nigga too. Like, what are we talking about? Because you gotta realize, bro, it's not people's, it's systems, bro. And that's what I want motherfuckers <laughs> to realize. Even when you start talking about nigga re revolutions, nigga, it's not people. It's not one person. It's the people, bro. And it's the, the organizing and the systems that they put around them that led to the overthrow, my nigga. It's not gonna it's, it's not gonna take one person integrating himself into an oppressive, violent position that's gonna liberate us, my nigga. It's not gonna happen. I don't care what the I don't care what progressive shit they pre they they doing in their press runs. I, I don't, it's it's not gonna happen, dog. It's, it's not I always explain it like this. I always explain it just like this. So whenever I'm with students or whatever, I'm doing a, like a talk or whatever, I say it like this. America is a train track. And the tracks have been laid centuries ago. I need y'all to feel me. Like, they've been laid centuries ago. The track has already been predetermined where it's going to go. And all we're doing is fighting over which conductor gets to drive it. And they're just upgrading the train. That <laughs> all they all they doing is just upgrading the train, making it harder for us to see that the conductor is in cahoots with the people building the track. And but yeah, we complaining that like this. And yeah, and yeah, and yeah, all we doing is complaining because the track is taking too long to get us where we need to go. But they've been telling y'all the track is not for y'all. We need to rip the train track up. We need to destroy the train. And take out any conductor that's trying to be a conductor. <laughs> for real though, and anybody who really want to side with them is an op too, and they get dealt with. Period. Like that's just what it is. I just want niggas to take all that energy and put it into the right places. Put it into your communities. Put it into the people that need it the most. Niggas is up here uplifting the folks that don't need us. That don't need us. They, these niggas gonna do what they do regardless of the black vote. How much niggas wanna harp on that and build that up? These motherfuckers gonna do what we're gonna do what they're gonna do regardless of that. Regardless of our support and our time, bro. Go put that shit into some shit that's actually gonna help people. That's actually gonna if, if your true goal is liberation, if your true goal is to see old people not only survive but thrive, put that into some of the movements and the people that's trying to make that happen. Your local community organizers, the niggas who don't have who don't have the platforms that the Bernie Sanders got, the niggas who don't have the millions and millions of dollars of backings, the niggas that don't have the 70 person team. And you know what's so wild about these elections, bro? Is these these things are just Ponzi schemes, bro. This shit is really just schemes, bro, because you have Bernie raising millions and millions of dollars for a campaign that lost, for a campaign that didn't even fucking come close. So imagine if all that money was actually just redistributed to feel me, the, the people, the organizations in the field that is actually doing mutual aid work during this fucking pandemic, nigga. Like, that money is just being fucking wasted. Yeah, I don't know, man. And it's also like, what, what happens when these niggas? What happens when these niggas? When these niggas lose? Like, where's Elizabeth Warren now? Like, what what, what work is she doing? Right. She, she co-sponsoring by that. She on she on Saturday Night Live, my nigga, doing the doing the Drake challenge, like flipping the switch. Like, what do these niggas do after they lose? What were these niggas doing before they lost? That's the thing. Like, what what were these niggas doing before they even was running for president? Come on, dog. These niggas don't have a. a and we gotta stop lowering the bar. Like niggas be doing the most minimal quote-unquote radical thing and we use that to project that into their entire politic because that speaks to the stage of colonization that we're in you know what i'm saying people don't see this is why people gotta see themselves as, as africans i already know that we're gonna get there but that's why people gotta see themselves as, as, as africans because if you understood your position as a colonial subject you would recognize that the instruments of death that were created to keep you in subjugation are never ever gonna free you they were designed to keep you in the cycle of death America is a corporation of death. So why would this corporation of death go against its business model out of nowhere 300, 400, 700 years into its history? You know, that, that, that doesn't make sense. That's it's, a morality? It's, it's, yeah, right, nigga. Yeah. <laughs> we make it on morals, nigga. Home of the free, land of the brave. <laughs> we make it on morals, nigga. <laughs> Come on. Come on, man. Niggas got to lay state boots, bro. I got, like, I be trying to tell niggas, bro, you got to read, dog. You got to read. And, I, and you got to read the right shit. You can't just read everything. And it's like, there's audio books these days too, bro. There's audio books. For those man, that can't read. Nigga, there's podcasts as well, you feel me, that is breaking down these theories, that is talking about revolutionary theory, that is talking about revolutionaries of the past, you feel me? So that's why I should, this radical content, this shit is so important.
Q, I mean, you made the point, or you were saying, you don't know if we're going to get into it, but I think we could just fucking jump into it right now. Like, why is it that black folks in America, black folks abroad start to see themselves as, as what they truly are, and that's Africans? Uh, because I believe in pan-Africanism as the only solution to our problems as African people. Uh, can you, can you define pan-Africanism for, for the listeners that might not know what it is? Sure, sure. Pan-Africanism is the total unification and liberation of the African continent and the diaspora under the banner of scientific socialism. All 54 states, all gender, sexuality, size, colors, and shapes. That's what it is. And one currency, one visa, one land, one, one, and one people. But one we destiny. have a plurality of, for real, one destiny, one land. And this is the question of land that we've always had to deal with. People like the lesser respected now, you know, people like Garvey, the more respected like Kwame Nkrumah, Thomas Sankara, Amilcar Cabral, uh, Malcolm X, George Padmore, W.E.B. Du Bois, Sekou Touré, like, you know, Walter Rodney, Maurice Bishop, even even uh, Kwame Touré will argue that Fidel Castro is one of the biggest Pan-Africanists in history because of his ability to help the African continent and people within the, the diaspora. And the reason why it's important to see yourself as African is because we are in a colonial struggle that has never left us. Just because we got on them both doesn't mean that we stopped being African. I always make this point that there are white folks who ain't never even been to Europe, ain't never even been to Ireland, ain't never even been to France, ain't never even been to Germany, never even been to Britain. But yet, when you ask them, what are you? Oh, I'm Britain. I'm, I'm British. I'm, I'm a one-third French. I'm, I'm, I'm European. I'm half, I'm half German. But when black people want to claim the rightful identity of African ancestry, I'm an African in America, I'm African in the Caribbean, you can even call yourself an African-American, but you know what you called yourself first before? American-African. So go ahead, bro. Like, you can have it which way you want. The end of the day is we have a question of land that needs to be solved. There are 54 states that are under the, under the control of the colonial powers in the Western imperialist powers. And it's our duty as African people to see that unification is our only way forward. I'm not one of those people who is a pessimist who believe that it's only black people who gonna free black people. I do believe that we do need coalition work. So we do need to have, you know what I'm saying, intracommunalism like Huey Newton professed. But African people are at the centrality of the stage that was set to build this new world. I need people to understand that the world that you are in right now is a European invention. The world that you are in right now is a construction of the colonizer. And it does not have to be this way. And that if you recognize yourself and if you look in the mirror and if you look at those old photos that people just be glossing by, really look at those old photos. Really look at those photos of the auction block. Really look at those photos of pre-colonial African history. Really look at them. And look at yourself. Because that's you. And then look at the colonizer. That's them. It's literally right here in front of us. We just have to see it as a struggle for land. If we don't have, and especially in the age of climate change, telling me black people don't need land is about as asinine as saying that a whale don't need water. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no freedom without land. And because the land is like, if we understand colonization, if we understand settler colonialism, our oppression is tied to land. And I think that's what people don't realize. The taking of it, the, the acquiring of it, <laughs> the depletion of it. The exploitation of it, <laughs> the environmental change. Like, it's based off of fucking land. It's based off of the resources that the land provides it, right? So I think, yeah, we, we, this shit is so important, bro. Like the question of land, you know? And I think, you know, us black people, us Africans who was enslaved in America, you feel me? It's like, we are landless people. And then, you know, what claim the land that we have too as well is like a question that comes up. So do you think you could dive a little bit into that? Cause you know, there's always been, you know, what the Republic of New Africa, right? And then there's been those right. like, go back to Africa movements, you know, and this is a question, you know, right. I think I've even struggled with, especially, you know, we think about like indigenous people and, and, and indigenous sovereignty, you know, on America, right. On Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. um, so what's mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? I'll, I always think about this as like a multifaceted conversation because Pan-Africanism is one of the richest traditions that for some reason is taken as a joke. And I know why it is because it's because we got these niggas like Omar and shit. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Kind of consciousness over, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's just, that's just kind of what's been made a joke is, you know, people while running around in dashikis talking about, you know, transphobic things and homophobic things, but they want to say, we here for the Africans. It's like, that doesn't work. It, that, that's never going to work. 
Yeah. It's because niggas who don't really understand it are kind of being propelled as the thought leaders of it. Yeah. The black man. Exactly. You make the whole point of all black people, <laughs> yeah. shape, sizes, gender, sexuality, and like that's the part that the it's niggas that I've been speaking on it have been left have been leaving out. And a lot of these niggas in the yeah. in all seriousness, like them niggas is damn near agents of the states because they is what are we like making up their own version of Pan Africanism and we know that Pan Africanism is working free us. And it's you know, it's putting a lot of people away towards Pan Africanism because of the fucking hotel propaganda. Yep. That's a good that's a that's a really great point. I've talked about that with Kings in the past before. We never really had to articulate that like that. I like that. And the whole point is when you look at what has always been on the radar and what's actually been a threat to the state, really look at history. It's really never been internal uprisings that have been sustainable for African people in America to be able to get freedom. That's an important component when I'm talking about revolutionary violence, but in the process of revolution for African people, there has to be a reconnection process. There has to be a repatri- There has to be some form of repatriation. There has to be some form of population that, goes back. There has to be some population that stays here. There has to be some population in the Caribbean that fights for freedom there, and, and, and so on and so forth. Because if we look at history, they didn't fear Malcolm. He was just the angry Negro preacher until he went to Ghana and then met with Kwame Nkrumah and was actually able to start talking about getting funds to Africans in America. See, that's when it gets scary. That's when it gets spooky. When Martin Luther King goes to Ghana and says, okay, you know what, let's, let's actually talk. You know what I'm saying? When it's like W.E.B. Du Bois saying, yo, we need to go to China. We, we need to go to all over the world. And it's internationalism, black internationalism, and a subset of that, well, I'm sorry, for me, the overtone of that is Pan-Africanism. Black internationalism and, and solidarity is the two components that we will always need. Because the state always takes notice when Africans are connecting. That is why black power slogans were banned in Trinidad in the 50s. That is why Malcolm X couldn't go to Jamaica for uh, to universities for certain times. Not because Jamaica didn't want him and black people in Jamaica weren't feeling that. It's because they were feeling that. And it's always going to be because of that that we get the whole out here saying that we just got to buy a black bank and we got to put a credit card. No, it's just all the, you know, the bull. It's just, it's just unnecessary. It all comes down to a question of land and organization. And the question that I always lead people with when, when they tell me, well, when has pan Africanism ever worked? I said, well, when have you tried to be a Pan-Africanist? Facts. Because history shows it has. <laughs> <laughs> Nigga, like, did revolutions not happen on the continent? Did niggas not overthrow colonial powers? You feel me? Was Cuba not giving fucking aid to revolutionary movements on the continent? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. What, y- what y'all say? Niggas don't know their history, dog. Niggas don't know their history. That's why it's important. We because, you know, you know, shit. Historical historical illiteracy is the lifeblood of propaganda. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, because you have to keep a people disinformed. I mean, you have to keep people misinformed and running around with the wrong information for them to buy into propaganda. Because you can't tell somebody who knows the history of China, even just on a Wikipedia level, that, oh my God, China's a dictatorship where only one person has power. That's that racist orientalist bullshit that they put on that and North Korea. Because they wanted to think that, oh, wait, Asian people all have this one mind. Wait, isn't that the same thing as saying that all African people have one mind, the animal gene and the warrior gene? Oh, wait, that's eugenics. But people don't know what eugenics is because they don't study history because America has to keep the people sedated with individualism. Just get yours, bro. Just get your little billion. Just get your little billion that you'll never see. You realize that you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning? (laughs) You got a better chance of getting struck by lightning than actually seeing a billionaire. (laughs) <laughs> man but oh, hey shit, n- n- niggas don't niggas don't read and niggas don't study but that shit ain't funny because it's true but it's <laughs> like like when you when you realize like how just how far off niggas are bro like damn i mean you, you kind of the devil you gotta credit the devil the devil has fucking colonized these niggas are working over 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 time dog not only do they have, they already laid the foundations for centuries, they still going hard at this shit. Like, they never, like, these niggas act like it never happened. That's how hard they work. And they building train tracks across the globe. <laughs> <laughs> Them niggas doubling up on the train tracks, nigga. Niggas talking about they already been laying, and they laying new shit. They finding new routes. Yeah. To still get you to the same point. Yeah. 
So I think, you know, to sum up this conversation and then transition into the extended episode, I think it's important, you know, to talk about just a little bit of, you know, COVID-19. I've seen you've been talking about this pandemic and, um, you know, what steps should black radicals be taking in and what, what should we be advocating for? Leverage your community, your organization, your platforms, whatever you have to advocate for debt cancellation, like housing, jobs, people should, people, if I'm being real, the government could be giving us $2,000 a month in UBI and they could do whatever they want in terms of that. So if people want to av advocate for, you know, stipends for disabled folks, um, definitely we need to be boosting our trans uh, family in this time, our trans Africans, we definitely need to be boosting our disabled Africans and their needs and listening to them, childcare needs, we need to be advocating for stronger unions, we need to be advocating for free health care now, which is another point on Bernie. Bernie has abandoned even trying to push for Medicare for all in his uh, last press release last week, which shows that he's a op. But that's a whole other point. We need to be ad advocating for food. We need to keep our eyes on the enemy. And we also need to understand that what is about to happen in the next couple of months is going to take real solidarity, strength, and study. Because 10 million people have just applied for unemployment. This is and higher than the height of the Great Depression. Exactly, exactly. And this is higher than the height of the Great Depression. So it's about to get really spooky, but we just waiting in the water. That's what we've always been in this country. We've always been in a cycle of death, and we've always had to navigate it. And it's sad that we have to continue to do it, and it's sad that we have to do this work. And along the way, I know that a lot of people are going to get tired, and a lot of people sell out. A lot of people don't want to do the work anymore. But I tell you this, man, I look at it like this. The thing that motivates me every day is knowing that I'm going to have to look black babies in the face one day and they're going to say, why the fuck you didn't do nothing? Straight up. Niggas, got, you, only, you, you have two options, bro. Like, to lay down or fight. That's really your options. Like, it comes it's, it's that fight, simple. <laughs> it's that simple. You either going to lay down or you're going to fight. And I think that's what, it's a, it's a, it's a fucked up ass reality to know, like, you know, that's what we've been doing. For the last 400 plus years, right? It's just like fighting to survive, nigga. Fighting to survive. And when we get the brief moments, putting in putting in plans for thriving, for thrival, you know? And I mean, it's just, it is what it is, nigga. And like you said, we owe it to the future and we owe it to our ancestors because them niggas ain't tap out. And we, we owe it to ourselves. On top of that, we owe it to three, it's three levels of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yourself, your ancestors, and the people, and the people, you feel me, after you. Back. Appreciate you, Q, for real. You want to uh, plug your socials before we go on to this next uh, extended episode for our Patreon? Yeah, for sure. Just follow me on Twitter at Q Got No Rings. That's Q G O T N O R N G S. And we should we should plug your pod. I know it's um I think you only did a few episodes. Fragments Pod South, SoundCloud dot com slash Fragments Pod. Yeah, it's only a few, but that nigga got some heat, man. I'm, I'm telling y'all, this is tap into Q, it. I, when I met Q, I, I didn't realize the nigga was only 23. <laughs> like, well, you like. Niggas is sharp, bro. Like, I, I told, I told B, um, you, you, y'all two remind me a lot of each other, bro. Like, y'all, y'all historians and y'all own rights. Like, you niggas just know so much, so much black history, so much African history is nuts. And that's, that's two things I admire about y'all niggas. Cause I can't remember dates for shit, dog. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't remember. Like, and that shit is, it's hella important, bro. It's hella important. So y'all niggas, you know, you should take some, some pride in that shit, bro. I appreciate it, bro. For real, that's love. So tap in our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpie for extended content. You feel me? Shit is needed now more than ever. You feel me? Support us. Patreon.com slash hellblackpie. You feel me? Extended content, much more. We got some merch up there. You feel me? We got that hell black coffee mug up there. You feel me? So you got your black coffee or your tea, your black tea or your lemon ginger tea, whatever you be drinking. So tap in with our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpie.